Welcome back, folks. <clears throat> this is Wednesday, uh, April 28th, and we are continuing our conversation with Commissioner Baker, Department of Corrections, and we're shifting gears to what we um, we're thinking, and I'm going to phrase it as Transitional Housing 101. And when we set up the schedule last week, we thought it would be really good seeing that we have a new committee here with new members um, to really talk about what's in play now for our transitional housing for folks who are re-entering from an incarcerated facility. And I know the terminology may be changing over time into looking at more supportive housing versus transitional housing. Um, <clears throat> there's a variety of ways that Corrections works with sometimes our community partners for um, housing opportunities or beds for folks who are re-entering. And, um, and DOC I know goes out to contract or RFP for proposals for that. So it's, and right now we may be involved in a little changing world um, based a lot on where Justice Reinvestment has been doing their work and where they, particularly last fall, and then through November, December, beginning of January, really finding gaps in our reentry uh, housing where we really need to beef up our community partners, be that Dale, ADAP, DMH, our designated agencies, our recovery centers, um, and you know, our partners within the Agency of Human Services, because what tends to happen is people just say, well, that's DOC's problem. DOC takes care of it. It's DOC's budget. They deal with it. We don't want to deal with their folks. And um, Justice Reinvest, the Council of State Governments, really saw gaps there within um, our supportive system in the community for folks who are re-entering. So there may be a shift happening within DOC from our way of providing transitional housing beds to a new model. So one thing that we need to know for the committees, how many beds do we have out there now? What were the beds maybe five, 10 years ago so that the committee members can see that over time we have increased our tr transitional housing beds. And yes, we may have numbers of beds, but what do those numbers reflect and what are the support mechanisms around those beds? And that may be where we lead our discussion. So I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Baker to give us an overview. Um, and then we have some folks here from D DOC that deal directly with um, the housing situation. So Commissioner, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, for the record for this uh, recording, I'm Jim Baker, the Interim Commissioner of Corrections, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity um, to come in and talk about our housing program. Let, let me start. I, I thought what I would do was do an overview because if it was two weeks ago, the conversation probably would look a little bit different. Some of you have reached out for me um, because of some changes we're making um, around our housing program. And I think I just kind of want to give an overview of that change because Moving forward as of January, or uh, yes, uh, July 1st, excuse me, it will look different. Um, and, and I thought it would be good for us to kind of talk about how we got there. And then I'm gonna ask Emily and Derek um, to talk about um, where, we're, where we are and where we're moving forward, but also kind of give an overview of the theory of change that we went through to get to where we are. So with that said, let me just, let me quickly do an overview because I want to get the record straight. There's a lot of conversations going on. Probably since I've been commissioner, I have gotten more contact from individuals on this issue in the last five days than any other issue. And I, I just, I think I want to take the opportunity to get this record set straight. Um, Community Restorative Justice Unit of the Vermont Department of Corrections has been supplying housing um, for re-entry into the community from facilities since 2005. And that, that uh, consisted of partnerships with uh, about 18 community providers. And we've had a capacity of about 250 beds slash apartments statewide. And the goals, you know, the goals are, are that we wanna provide uh, stable housing for individuals returning to the community. 
supervise and support individuals in the least restrictive environment we can and provide opportunities for reintegration and connections to the communities and services. We all know that housing is one of the basic needs of any human being and coming back into a, to a community from a facility, um, housing can be a real challenge. And so over the years, Corrections has worked on that. Now, Justice Reinvestment too, the chair talked about this, um, has really given us some guidance inside Corrections about a thought process of where we need to go. And uh, the staff was directed to take a look at how could we find a new model of housing that addresses the issues that were brought up by the council of state governments, particularly around the issue of technical violations and us reincarcerating individuals who are in the community that, that um, violated technical parts of their supervision, be it parole, furlough, um, probation, and those conditions. And so some examples of that is a lot of our housing has been sober living housing. So you, you, uh, uh, your, your addiction reoccurs, you have slippage, you, you lose your housing. Mm -hmm. And in, in the past, that could, and in a lot of cases did, lead to people being reincarcerated. Re and we, we got criticized for that, that, that our programs were not flexible enough. So in the summer of 2020, staff started on a course of uh, a theory of change to take a look at how we would uh, reinvest our transitional housing dollars. Um, and we, we engaged experts from the Agency of Human Services to participate in that, to include the Director of Performance Improvement um, within AHS to find out how we could improve what we do. I think at this point, I also wanna mention that we spend, and Derek or Emily can correct me, but I believe we spend somewhere around $6 million a year on housing. Right. Yeah. And it's a blend of funds. Some of it's Medicaid dollars and some of it's general fund dollars and some of it comes from other sources. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is about six million dollars. And prior to the theory of change, the request for proposal that went out, the bidding conference that we held, the screening process that we went through, we had 250 bids. So that theory of change was put together. And like I said, some of this was taking a look at and we, we did some self-reflection as well. And we grappled with this high rate of reincarceration, looking at statistics from 2017 to 2019. And um, we realized that a lot of people were being reincarcerated because of these technical violations that were being driven by the rules of the housing that they were in. And based on a detailed need assessment and data analysis done by us, um, it became clear um, that we, we needed to move to a different, uh, a different um, request for proposals and that we had put out in the past. So in 2021, we put out requests for proposals early in the year. Based on that theory of change, um, trying to find programming, ensuring that people are not evicted because of program violations um, that would lead to recidivism, homelessness, and other negative outcomes. So um, we also wanted to interact in those services, interject and wrap around, excuse me, in those services, harm reduction models, harm reduction intervention, formal connections to other housing interventions. Um, and, and, and the key in doing this is, is really shifting our mindset from what I said earlier in the prior testimony about the term traditional housing to we believe stabilized housing is what we would like to refer to as. Because, um, you know, transitional housing, you know, I, when, when staff talks to me about transitional housing, I think of young adults that I dealt with in my law enforcement career, they were couch surfing and they're, they're living in a room with three bag, you know, three garbage bags full of their, their life in those bags. Just not the way to transition someone back into the community. So in March of 2021, based on that RFP that went out, um, we received 25 applications. And we had a cross agency team assembled to review those and score the applications. 
And um, they, this process took over four weeks and 10 hours of meetings to, to, to go through these proposals, looking for the key elements that we were looking for based on our theory of change. And um, you're gonna get a presentation in a minute uh, to understand where we are with housing about what we went through to get to that point. And then before we, we finished our decisions, those were scored using a, a, a rubric that included um, the uh, bidder's experience, program characteristics, and the alignment with the theory of change, which is really what we were getting for direction from all the folks at the legislature involved in justice reinvestment and from the council of state governments, what the costs were and what's the connection, which is key, although it was the smallest element of the percentage, what's the connection to permanent housing? And then before we made our decisions, we had in-depth conversations with some of the bidders, uh, probation and parole offices, uh, who, are, who are primarily the users of, of the process. And um, then on the 26th, we made final decisions. And, and in, in essence, what we're moving to is 265 beds up from where we were at a similar cost. Um, we are moving away from congregate housing um, to more because it gives us the opportunity to get people into more permanent housing. We also believe that the research is clear that if you've got five people living in a congregate setting, that all five of them to manage their risk, because that's what we do, we manage risk for the individual to manage their risk looks different for five different folks. Mm -hmm. So when you have house rules that are, for example, you need to be in by 10 o'clock, that may not apply risk-wise to everyone. And if someone reuses, the risk may be higher for one than the other. And so part of the theory of change was around this. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably covering some of the area that you're going to rehear again from, from Derek and Emily. And we came to the conclusion and awarded contracts as a result of that. Yeah, what some of you are, could be hearing from constituents or stakeholders or advocates is that there are some traditional partners that we made the decision to no longer fund. And uh, you know we, we didn't do that lightly because we're moving to a new format, a new concept, a new theory of change based upon the work that's been done in justice reinvestment too. And quite honestly, um, my staff won't say this, but I will. Some of the folks didn't sharpen their pencils. They just didn't do it. And they came in with proposals that didn't line up with, didn't line up with what we put out for a request for proposals. And uh, I, I think we did a great job due diligence wise to holding a bidders conference, answering questions, giving feedback. And some of the partners, and, and I, I can't get into specifics here because we still have to work through contracts with the new providers and those contracts aren't signed yet. So, you know, legally I should not be talking about specifics about certain um, providers. But as we work through that, we're also discovering that some of the beds that we walked away from, we believe other folks can maybe use those beds. So we're already in one situation we partner with Commissioner Brown at DCF, and um, they're picking up some beds from, from, from that provider. And I think there's at least one other situation in the state that we, we are gonna have similar conversations with DCF. So I'm gonna leave it there. I wanted, to, I wanted to lay that groundwork because since Thursday of last week, there's been a lot of phone calls, a, a lot of misinformation floating around. Um, and it's not easy when someone gets the news that we're deciding to go somewhere else. But I, I wanna end this by saying that um, this wasn't some type of you know, knee jerk reaction that uh, the process, and I was briefed three or four times on this, the process that was put in place was methodical, it was scientific, it was based on research and based on what we think is the best future for our housing program. So with that, I'm gonna stop, Madam Chair. So I just want to be clear that when the RFPs went out and they went out in January, the RFPs were very clear that there was a, um, 
a change in terms of the model of providing secure housing. So the folks who submitted their bids were very were clear that there was the lay of the land had shifted. Uh, I, I'm going to let Derek or Emily answer that, but from where I sit, there should have been, and, and um, if anybody's read the, the request for proposals, I believe it was pretty clear. Okay, I just because that was a question that has been circulate, circulating around. Um, uh, so I, I can address that if you'd like. Could you just identify yourself for the record, please? Of course. This is Emily Higgins, and I'm the Corrections Housing Administrator in the Department of Corrections. So I'm in the um, Community and Restorative Justice Unit overseeing our um, housing grants for transitional housing. Uh, and, and what I can say is that um, the theory of change was shared broadly in the community with all existing partners, with um, uh, agency staff across the Agency of Human Services uh, in the fall of 2020. So there was plenty of time before we even issued the RFP in January to sort of digest and understand the direction that we were taking. And then we did have a bidders conference as the commissioner mentioned, where we walked through the RFP, we answered questions. The theory of change was in fact incorporated into the RFP in its entirety. Um, and it, as you'll see when I run through it, it very clearly lays out the direction that we were heading in. So I think it's fair to say it was, it was very, um, we informed people in advance, we sought input into the theory of change before we finalized it, and um, it was not a surprise to any existing providers. Thank you. So we do have a question, Michael. Uh, yes, Commissioner Baker, I obviously, you know, I went back and forth on email a little bit from a constituent question that I forwarded to you, and this, I believe, 100% answers what I need to get back to my constituents. So thank you for that dialogue. And basically the bottom line, I'm just going to report back to her is that just what both you and Emily just stated is, in fact, we've added beds. It's just that we lost some of our former partners because they didn't meet the, you know, the constraints or the model that we're looking for today. So I think it's pretty straightforward and I thank you for that input and uh, that will take care of that. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I'm sorry I couldn't catch up with your representative. The one thing I will add to this is that, um, you know, there is room for some other conversations about creating other opportunities for bed space in state government. Sure. Um, sure. So how that plays out is still yet to be played out. But Understood. Yeah. No, but that takes care of Thank you very much. Our decisions, we've made our decisions and, uh, you know, we're moving on. Sure. No, it makes perfect sense to me. Thank you. So we have another question, Michelle. Yeah, yeah, Commissioner Baker, I'm just wondering, you mentioned that it's going to be expanded to 265 beds. How is that geographically distributed? Like, is there going to be a transitional housing option in every region, in every county? Like, how far is somebody going to have to go from their home in order to access one of these beds? Representative, that's a great question. And, and um, my staff should have pinged me to remind me to say this. One of the other advantages of what we think are many advantages is that, for example, in the, in the women's housing options, they're pretty much based and housed in um, Chittenden County, right? So our, our theory of change is now spreading uh, uh, more um, evenly across the state. So we have options, for example, for, for, for women, not just in Chittenden County, but other places in the state as well, to get them closer to their home, closer to support networks, et cetera, Instead of you're from Bennington County, your 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 housing bed is in Chittenden, and your support system is you know two and a half hours away. So thank you for asking that, and I should have brought that up earlier. Hey Karen. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner, for this overview. This is very helpful in um, getting information out to folks in the community that have questions. One of the other questions that has come up is around just this transition. Cause I think there are folks that are like very excited where this new direction is going, but also realizing like, are these beds set? Are they guaranteed? You know, folks who are going to congregate sites 
do we know they're going to have a place to go? And I don't know if Derek and Emily are going to be getting into that, but that would be helpful to know what the status is of that. Yeah, I, I'll let I, I'll let Emily answer that question because um, as you and I spoke, Representative, you know there is a plan. We're not shutting down and just leaving people on street corners. I mean that'd be irresponsible of us. But I'll let Emily answer that. Uh, yes, absolutely. We're working closely with providers. We've verbally notified all partners and had conversations about transition planning, and we're going to engage with the local probation and parole offices to ensure that existing residents of programs that are no longer going to operate are stably housed in another location. No one is going to be reincarcerated due to lack of housing because of this transition. That's we've been very clear about that. Um, and we're very invested in making sure that people have a smooth and untraumatic transition um, due, through this process. So we have a couple more questions. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, if some of these questions might be answered when we shift over to Derek. So um, I don't wanna stop the questions, but if they're more applicable to Commissioner Baker, yes. If it's more some of the nuances, we might wanna wait until we hear from Derek. Uh, Scott? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I should wait for Derek. Um, I, I, Commissioner Baker, you mentioned um, you received 25 proposals, I think, uh, to, to the RFP and you're moving away from a congregate housing. So I guess I'm wondering, can you say uh, how many proposals you're, you're accepting or I don't know how much detail you can get into? Okay. I'll, I'll let Emily answer that because I don't have the exact number, but I know Emily does. Well, he, well here's, here's, here's a more general question. And that is um, if we're moving away from congregate housing, then are, are, are the providers that we're now uh, proposing to deal with um, sort of owners of, of, of smaller units or around around the state? Is that is that sort of how it's gonna go? Okay, well, maybe, yes. maybe I'll, wait, I'll wait for Emily to, to talk then, thanks. I can just briefly say that we'll have uh, 15 providers statewide in the next state fiscal year. Um, and most of the housing will be scattered site apartments um, where there's more flexibility and dignity for folks reentering the community. So then typically a provider would, would own apartments around, around the state. Or lease. Yeah, around an area, perhaps. Yes, and we'll be in every district. We're actually expanding into Orange County and Lamoille County where we've never had transitional housing before for DOC. Great, okay, thank you. So Kurt, you had your hand up and went down. Is it more intricate in terms of what Derek might get into or is it broader for the commissioner? Oh, it, it can wait for, for Derek, I think. Okay, so this may be a good transition. So Derek, why don't you um, introduce yourself for the record? And I know you have a document that was submitted and it's posted on our webpage. So I don't know if you're gonna be working through that document. Yes, yeah, so um, greetings and thank you for the opportunity. My name is Derek Neo Dovnik. I use he, him pronouns especially with my last name, it may be uh, just easier to stick with that. Uh, I am the Community and Restorative Justice Executive with the Vermont Department of Corrections. And it's been a privilege to engage in this opportunity, which I think has been a great example of how the executive branch um, strives to function. Um, I think the couple features that I would just like to either reiterate because I think the commissioner did a fantastic job um, really touching on many of the points at a level of detail for which I don't want to be redundant. Um, but a couple of features that I would like to point out before we walk you through, uh, again, this theory of change document. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to like what for that, if that language is, is unfamiliar to folks, like what are, what are we talking about when we talk about a theory of change? Um, so first, I just want to state that, um, uh, Chair Emmons, in your opening comments, I believe I heard um, a request on behalf of your committee to understand also a little of the historical context, and, and Commissioner Baker touched on, on this, but I, I, I'd, I'd like to just add a little bit and complement what he provided. Um, 
the transitional housing uh, portfolio, if you will, from the Department of Corrections really grew out of a specific time and context <clears throat> in which we were experiencing overcrowding, <clears throat> excuse me, in our Vermont facilities. And we were, we had yet to uh, engage in the mechanisms whereby we uh, procure out of state beds. And so we were looking to, are there other ways that uh, the Department of Corrections could partner with our own communities and, uh, and support the uh, programs that would in fact represent the mechanism by which folks who had hit their minimum sentence and were eligible for release, but the primary barrier to their release was lack of approved housing, if we could create a mechanism through which we could alleviate that part of the burden on the system at the time. And at that time, so now I'm going back over 15 years, and, and of course, Chair Emmons, you're well aware of this history, but for the benefit of uh, some other co uh, committee members who may not uh, be as, uh, as aware, uh, this was a big pressure on corrections for many, many years. It was what we used to call sort of the B1 list because the code that signified that the primary uh, thing that was keeping somebody in prison was lack of housing, approved housing, um, was just called B1. And that was an expansive list. It was, you know, ballooned well into the 250s for a state our size. That's a significant um, portion of our, you know, that could have been over 10% of our incarcerated population at times. So we began to, um, as resources were provided, iterate this um, portfolio. And, and, and I'd say that there was a really clear, um, value proposition, which was we have people who can be out, but they don't have housing. So we were very happy and rightly so to begin to um, um, procure programs as the community would provide. And that's how over time we developed um, this kind of diverse portfolio. We kind of curated as resources and proposals came in. And I think that they were in the service of what we wanted at that time, a mechanism by which to get people who could be released but lacked approved housing into the community. And we continued to diversify that portfolio over time. I, I'd say what that portfolio, as time evolved, began to lack was an overarching hypothesis about how does this account for behavior change? How does this mechanism that Corrections is trying to support to get people out, poured into a broader uh, evidence-based understanding of how people gain self-sufficiency. And of course, consistent with this time period between 20, um, 2005 and now is a changing face of the population of who's incarcerated. That population becomes um, more um, affected by substance use disorder, opioid use disorder in particular, a higher rate of co-occurring disorders. Um, we increasingly become more judicious with the use of incarcerative beds. In other words, we, we expand our capacity to, to reserve prison for the most complex and potentially dangerous and we still manage to fill our facilities. So that speaks to the changing nature of our population. So these are some driving forces that, that I think are important to mention and, and hopefully provide some context to how we arrived in 2020, where of course, because of justice reinvestment as well, we took a step back and we asked ourselves like, what would the hypothesis that undergirds all of these housing investments be? And, and frankly, it was hard to find an elegant one because I don't think it grew out of a behavior change hypothesis. It grew out of a, a system relief valve need. And so that's an important thing, I think, from an executive branch administrator to explain to the legislative branch that we were in the service of a different goal 15 years ago than I believe and understand us to be now. So we asked ourselves, 
what are we trying to accomplish as the Department of Corrections in our housing investments? And that ported back to our overarching goal and mission of the department, which is to partner with the community in the research and treatment of criminal behavior and to be valued by the citizens of Vermont as that partner. And we took that further and said, what are the conditions that best promote dignity, self-sufficiency of the individual and community safety? And from that, we began to back out to a, a set of um, what I would call operant conditions. What are the characteristics, the dominant characteristics of environments that promote those values? And some of those characteristics include maximum ability to make choices. None of us particularly like having choices made for us as adults. Um, I, you know, I will offer that as a universal statement. And if, and if anybody would like to challenge that, I'm happy to be in dialogue. Um, when we have programs, as the commissioner got into, that have to manage a milieu and then also try within that primary goal to address the nuances of the individual, the needs of the milieu win out. And congregate settings, unfortunately, just don't allow the degree of responsivity, which is a, a core correctional principle. So we started cre creating this theory of change inductively. What do I mean by that? We looked at the values and the conditions and began to put them together, stand back and say, the optimal conditions that we believe based on the literature from SAMHSA, based on the literature from the US Interagency uh, Council on Homelessness, based on all the trauma-informed care and policy within the agency of services, these are the, the, the building blocks of the environments that we believe would best support self-sufficiency, stability, and integration, consistent with the pre-existing mission of corrections and the imperative of JRI to keep people in the community. And from that, we then began the process of articulating that, citing the research that that's based on, uh, and ultimately rolling this into the RFP that Emily is going to walk you through that theory in a moment. So I just want to sort of set that stage. And, and I think one or quick, two quick other things to, to mention, um, because I understand that for some of some longstanding organizational partners, this has a very um, you know, sudden um, feel to it. And, and, and I hear that feedback coming through and I'm sensitive to it. The procurement process is in fact the executive branch, in this case, articulating a hypothesis, which I firmly believe is a core component of what the executive branch should do. We should tell the people of Vermont why it is that we're gonna spend the money in this way. And then our job is to put that opportunity out to the community and really see what the market of ideas provides. So no singular bidder was precluded from the start in potentially being awarded grants through this RFP because we didn't know, again, what the marketplace of service provision would allow for. You know, that is the nature of a competitive bidding process. We were in the business of articulating uh, a literature and evidence-based theory as to what we believe best serves the people of Vermont, not only the people coming out of prisons, but our communities. How are we promoting community safety through the stability of people that we know have historically presented risk? Um, and then we had to see what, what came in and that was that whole scoring process. So all of this was predicated on uh, this theory of change. A theory of change is basically just a um, making explicit um, a, a, a belief system a set of inputs, a set of intended outcomes, and an explanation that bridges those two pieces. And in government, in the executive branch, we're constantly doing things. We're not necessarily always standing back and saying, what's the overarching theory and how are we evaluating it? So the theory of change, which both applied on the individual behavioral level and on the systemic level says, 
these are the overall values that we're gonna be guided by. These are our North Stars. And that's dignity, that's safety, that's stability. These are the observable conditions that we understand to be most illustrative of those values. And when these conditions are most in place, these are what the, the outcomes we expect. So that when we talk about theory of change, I just wanted to make that clear. It's just a, a surfacing, a making explicit of what frankly is often, you know, implicit, invisible, not um, packaged in a way that the public can understand. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to make clear and transparent to Vermonters why it is that we moved in this direction. And with that, unless you have more questions from me, which probably given the number of words I use, I'm guessing you don't, um, I'd like to turn it over to Emily, who can succinctly and elegantly take us through that theory of change. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Derek. So Emily, you're up next. So just um, walk us through. Sure. And just logistics wise, you all have access to the, the, the presentation of the theory of change. Um, uh, is, will that be visually shared during this presentation? Or are you each looking at it individually? We have it on our web page, so we can pull it up individually. And for folks who are on YouTube, you go to the House Corrections and Institutions web page and click on today's date, and it is there. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and it, it is also listed on the Department of Corrections uh, web page under our transitional housing section. So as Derek really clearly laid out, um, this was our process of creating a vision for the transitional housing offered by the Department of Corrections. And that vision we stated explicitly is that all Vermonters under supervision have the housing resources and relationships they need to thrive and keep themselves and communities safe. So the outcomes were trying to reach our dignity for the people that we're serving, stability, um, relationships that help increase their social capital, uh, and, and the people in the communities and the folks re-entering the communities themselves are safe from harm. Uh, and the conditions needed to have that happen are that people feel that they have value, that they contribute meaningfully to their community, community that um, there's trust, people experience consistency, equity, and transparency in the way that they're treated, and that they have choice, they have options about how they live their lives. As Derek was saying, um, people like to be able to have some control over their own life. And it's very important to recognize that this is not only um, the, the job of the Department of Corrections to take care of this, but the job of the community to help folks re-enter. It's a shared responsibility. And so based on our research, um, we stated that these interventions, these housing options need to be trauma-informed. They need to be personally meaningful and engaging for people. And people's basic life needs must be met before they can spend energy working toward their goals and priorities. Um, and what we know is that housing is foundational to successful reentry. And you're, it's very difficult to um, move out of addiction, um, to maintain stability without knowing where you're gonna sleep every night. So our primary goal in this transitional housing is to provide people with that stability. And then we also want to help people build their capabilities and strengths so that the, they reduce their risk of reoffending. that, um, the housing is person-led, supportive, and that there's programming available and services and support to increase their resilience and to move toward a thriving life. 
So our approach to do this was to shift our housing model um, to really focus on transitioning people into stable permanent housing that meets their needs. Um, that's local, that's flexible, that's um, supported. And we wanna make sure that people are not committing new crimes, that people feel an increased sense of hopeless, hopefulness and that they're connected to supportive relationships that help them thrive. So we walked through exactly what we were looking for uh, in terms of the reentry and case management model and the housing model um, and who the partners were in the Department of Corrections as well as, as, well as in reentry programs throughout the state. And I'm now on the third page where we very explicitly laid out how the program will be different. So in the past, we had sort of tiered uh, transitional housing that were based on offender risk profile and um, risk management. We had sober housing that was zero tolerance and very strict program rules that resulted in reincarceration if someone relapsed in many cases. And as Derek said, we, we sort of lacked an overarching housing philosophy that connected all of our program investments. And the program milieus of these congregate sites were not always um, trauma-informed in terms of practice and daily life. Referrals um, had Referrals to these programs were sometimes inconsistent or discretionary. And what we're really moving toward very intentionally is that the investments are targeted to programs that meet a range of DOC needs or the, the needs of people reentering the communities. So housing for sex offenders has traditionally been really difficult. So we were clear that we wanted to offer as much of that as possible and to focus on stable housing as the top priority and facilitate access through that housing to support services. And we also wanna focus on offender strengths and skill building, tenancy education, you know, really um, setting them up for success in the future and engaging the community and supporting that reentry and integrating all of our housing work with the broader continuum of care um, around serving vulnerable Vermonters. We're also in a process of engaging more fully with the community justice centers to address any conflicts that might come up in transitional housing in a proactive way. So our process has been to implement this theory of change with new partnerships and new providers um, we're going to continue to learn about this theory and make sure that uh, it actually is playing out the way we expect. We're going to enter into new grant agreements that will take effect July 1, and we'll offer ongoing training and support to implement best practices through our provider network. And then the final part of the theory of change at the bottom, what to expect. Um, lays out sort of a, a timeline of the steps involved. Um, DOC engaged staff, we engaged partners, we drafted and issued the RFP, we received proposals, we've determined awardees, and then our next steps are to co-design the evaluation and learning from this theory of change, facilitate the training and technical assistance needed, and co-present with partners and staff around that training and launch into our, our new grants grant agreements and continue learning and evaluating as we go and adjust as needed. So that's, that is our theory of change. It's great, Emily, and I, can, I really appreciate this um, PowerPoint, this presentation, the way it's laid out, it really does make a lot of, um, it's very clear in the process and very clear where we were in terms of what the program was and um, how it's being trans changed. That's why I really appreciate this 
presentation in the document. Thank you. So we have some questions, uh, Sarah, then Scott. Thank you. This is terrific to have you here. And I, I just wanted to say, um, the commissioner has heard me say this before. I, uh, my local community justice center back in December shared this with me and I've complimented the commissioner. So I won't, but I want to make sure that you all knew like it really, you know, it's, it's this theory of change and how you present it here um, uh, is really impressive. And I want to thank you for your work. Um, and so I just have a couple of questions because it's out like by the, I hear the way that you've laid this out, like how the program will be different. It doesn't necessarily mean that congregate housing is completely off the table, if I'm understanding it. It's that you're asking your partners to kind of deliver some, some clear services to go along with that congregate housing. Is that, is that am I understanding that correctly? Um, well, we have shifted um, substantially away from congregate housing. Um, in the past, we are through this change, we're no longer funding about 90 beds of congregate sober living. Mm -hmm. um, and we're instead investing in scattered site apartments that offer more flexibility and responsivity. Yeah. So it's not that we're eliminating congregate housing, we are still funding some congregate housing, but it's we're definitely shifting the emphasis to scattered site. Yeah, well, that's. Um, and I think I was I was on the committee last biennium, so we did hear um, from some of those kinds of providers, and and I've heard from through meetings that I've had with constituents and through our community justice center how so it was some of the challenges around congregate housing for people. So I that very much aligns with what I've been hearing. So one of my questions is I'm, I'm hoping that once you land and have all your conversations with your partners, you might be able to clearly address. Um, show us where some of the geographic um, locations are. You know, one of, the con one of the concerns that I hear about and that we've been hearing about, I think a few of us, um, is about that the, there's gonna be fewer beds for women. And that, ex that, that coming out, and I'd like to hear you talk about that because that was an issue before the theory of change. And I just wanna hear what your process and what you're finding and how you're gonna address that. because. Sure. That's important, I think. No, that's a, a very important question. And thank you for the opportunity to address it directly. Um, we have historically had limited congregate sites specifically designated for women in the state, um, up to three different sites at a time. Um, but as was mentioned earlier, that's very limiting in terms of location, in terms of being able to be near their communities. So with the scattered site apartments, we can serve women in every county of the state and we can serve them in their local community and um, they can get intensive services in that scattered site apartment, um, which allow them to succeed. Um, so it's, it's not that we're reducing beds for women, we're really actually dramatically increasing the opportunity for supported transitional apartments for women throughout so, the state. That's very helpful. And I, you know, sometimes we have this assumption because the women's facility is in, in Burlington and that a lot of the um, related services are locate, located there that there can be an assumption that all the women that we incarcerate like are, are from that community. But what I'm hearing from you that that's, you're shaking your head like, that's not true. And I, 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 I'm from the Southern part of the state. And I know that um, for us, for women in our community who might be in this situation, you know, being up in Burlington is far away. Um, mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing you say is that this, this might come as a big surprise to some of those providers though. I mean, this is a transition um, and and that we know that those kinds of transitions can be hard. Um, Absolutely. So, okay, this, I know others have questions, but this so, is very helpful, thank you. And, and if I may just add to that. So, so yeah, that's an important recognition. When we, when we discussed the potential directions that we were going with the local um, district managers, and in this case, the Burlington district manager, um, uh, he was quick to say, well, this will, this will have, uh, less of an impact on Chittenden County because most of the, the women served in that, uh, those programs are not actually from that area. The other piece I just wanted to mention is that um, while uh, we are definitely optimizing 
for what we call scattered site. And again, just to make sure that we're not using precious terminology, um, congregate sites, those are houses with different bedrooms and multiple people in it, right? Scattered site are apartments that are privately owned as, as the question was asked. Sometimes they might be owned by the grantee. We've got grantees that actually own the stock. We have other grantees that will master lease those apartments. So the organization has the legal agreement with the landlord. And then we have other grantees who use the funds that correction provides, use the relationships to establish the confidence and the connection and the uh, landlord relationships. But then the resident who's under correction supervision is the direct tenant and the leases in their name. So, so I just wanna break that down and add that while we are optimizing for a scattered site, we also recognize that this theory of change is, um, and, I, and I heard uh, Representative Dolan's question earlier about this, like, well, wait a minute, these congregate beds, we know those beds are there. In the scattered site model, we are placing faith and trust in providers to secure some of this stock. So if I, if I heard that correctly, Representative Dolan, um, we recognize that. So one of the things we intentionally did was not charge 100% into the scattered site and do away with all congregate. We kept some in strategic locations and to the issue of housing for women, we actually are going to be entering into uh, a new opportunity to house um, women um, in uh, the Rutland uh, area in a, con in a new congregate program too. So in that case, wanting to make sure that we're also attending to all the dimensions of this, we actually sort of ran slightly counter to the general direction and procured a fixed capacity in a congregate setting in the Rutland community. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Good, shut up. So we have a few more questions here. So we have Scott, Karen, and Mary. Yes, thank you. Just as regards uh, housing for women, um, supportive housing for women, it seems like the, uh, the scattered site approach will give you a lot more flexibility to, 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 place, oh, shit. to place women. Marsha, I think you're unmuted there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I was talking to my husband. <laughs> um, so, so that, that, that would be a real advantage to, to, to moving to the scattered site. Um, and, and my other thought, uh, this theory of change is really exciting to see. Um, it, my other thought is, is maybe more programming related instead of housing related, but um, I've had some interesting conversations with uh, my neighbor, John Perry, whose name some of you may probably know, um, uh, about, well, one, one of the things that he, that he said that really stuck with me um, was that a, a mechanism for human society, I guess you would say, is, is uh, this, this, this idea of, of reciprocity. Um, I do something for you, you do something for me. And, and that's how we build um, social connections. That's how we build social capital. So how do we, how do we, uh, how do we foster that? as in, in, in support of housing. Um, as I said, I guess it's probably more of a programming question than a, than a housing question, but it, it, it seems like a really, it seems like something that's, that's so important that it, it, it ought to be mentioned explicitly in the theory of change um, uh, document here. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, so we're doing something for the, for the offender by giving them housing. Um, how, do we, how do we get, get them to, to uh, do something for, for, for us, for us society, or how do we get them to ask for help? How do we ask them for help? You know, things like that. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to just quickly sort of speak to that. I don't mm -hmm. know if you were looking for a particular response, but I, I can't pass up the opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to chime in because, um, uh, John Perry is really, uh, you know, sort of founding architect of the broader kind of restorative landscape, along with his colleagues, Commissioner John Gorsick, uh -huh. and some other real thought leaders um, uh, 
from the Department of Corrections and, uh, and he's a, a, a mentor to me. And so, you know, I think um, both um, embedded in that theory of change and, and if you look at it again, you'll see, you know, dignity, that's a top line piece. So what are the preconditions that people need to fully contribute, right? To be full, you know, I, I think dignity really keys off of that. Uh, the ability to add value, right? So not just to be a receiver and a consumer of social services, but to recognize that, that one has uh, important value, both in the most basic way that when people wake up and hopefully are gainfully employed, they can, they can civically participate at the base level of paying taxes. And, 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 that, and that's important. I mean, like that's an important way of, of, of fulfilling one's civic reciprocal responsibility in, uh, you know, in our version of democracy, right? And, and then engage in positive relationships that have all of those informal um, reinforcements. And so again, it's our belief that the conditions that best get people to be whole in their selves so that they can add that kind of value so that their lives are not completely a function of the deficits that they represent to the society and how we are trying to avoid the risk that they may or may not represent, but rather how in fact they can be assets within the context of their own personal relationships, professional relationships and broader community. Um, one of the ways we've also done this, and this didn't get flagged, was um, within the RFP, which I encourage everybody to spend some time with, this theory of change was an attachment to the RFP. The RFP goes into much more depth. One of the domains that we asked programs to reflect on was how they integrate individuals who themselves have lived experience in the criminal justice system into their programs. So many of these programs um, have folks who either on a policy level have helped guide it or on a staffing level as appropriate um, themselves bring direct experience, lived experience uh, with the criminal justice and, and are now in that generative space of adding the credibility and that value back into these uh, services. So uh, all, of, uh, all of that, I hold very dearly and I just appreciate you bringing in that notion of uh, reciprocity, social capital, because ultimately there's a limit to what professionalized services can do um, they're critical, they're important. Uh, we can, we need clinical and professionalized services. But again, I think we have a really elegant vision that we have to be a partner that, uh, with the community. And the pieces I hear you speaking to come from the informal connections developed through community relationships. And so when you have your own apartment, I mean, on a certain level, this is about what's the difference between having your own place that you get to call home and build yourself from there, as opposed to wonderful environments. I guess, if I may, the congregate sites that we've had and the people who work in them have been incredibly heartful, incredibly dedicated. And I've had the pleasure of working with these individuals and these are not light decisions. This is more about structural advantages to giving people maximum choice and flexibility. Mm -hmm. Thank yep. you for, for, for hearing that. Yes, thank you. It's, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a person to person thing that is informal and, and, you know, can I borrow a cup of sugar? Can I lend you a cup of sugar? You know, that that's right. Of, right. You know, great. Thank you. Uh, Karen and then Mary. <clears throat> yes, thank you. This is very helpful and it's helpful to see how this theory of change and the um, housing plan fits into justice reinvestment because I think it aligns really well um, and just putting it all together. This is great. Um, and so Derek, I think you actually answered some of my questions. It was helpful to hear that there was the intentional understanding, like there is a little bit of leap of faith in, in the housing stock. And I think, so that's helpful to know that that was part of the process. Um, another question I had was specifically around um, with the loss of Northern Lights, and knowing that that was, um, you know, put in place, it was gender responsive housing. And I think you just said the Rutland piece. So I'm hoping that that is a, a 
a substitute or that's replacing that. So that is one question. Um, another question I have, and I think I've shared before that I work for community justice center. So it, you know, I have that in the back of my mind of, it sounds like some community justice centers are the recipient of these, um, but CJCs across the state might um, also be partnering with that. And our, I'm curious how that um, is, is it being formalized? Is that, uh, how is that being tracked? Cause I know that community justice centers are funded through DOC. So would be curious about that. And then the other one I just wanna throw out there, I know I'm putting a lot out is really looking forward to the data and evaluation piece of it. Cause I think this is huge. This is a new direction. And um, it'll be really interesting to see in a year from now, which types of sites really worked well? What were the factors that made them work well? Um, I feel like this is a really big launching off point. And um, I would just encourage you to collect as much data as you can so we know what's working and why. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll speak really quickly and I'll hand it over to Emily for finer points. And I'll take those in reverse order on the data piece. And Emily mentioned this in terms of the next steps in that theory of change. Um, we try to apply what uh, may be referred to as a responsive regulation. Responsive regulation is basically taking the principles of restorative justice of doing with and applying that to regulatory relationships. So, um, you know, the state can and sometimes does award money and then tell people what they need to do with it and, you know, come and evaluate it and grade them. And that's, that's one model. Uh, another model is that you're co-creating you're actually investing in the expertise of the people who are doing the work and you're saying, what do you value? How do you know you're doing your best work? What are quality measures and better off measures that you think the state should be in the business of, of asking you to provide? So that's our next step in terms of creating, uh, and we've done this, our existing program. So we literally involve our providers in populating our data metrics. It's not singularly the state determining we have things that we're going to need to know that, that the legislature should be asking us for, and we're, we're excited to provide. Um, but there are other relational dimensions of how, how we will develop that. Um, and we're also on the precipice of actually having a transition um, within our unit um, and um, bringing on uh, uh, a new person who will be spearheading our data um, analysis and collection. So it's a wonderful, just coincidental opportunity to use this to set a really clean and clear direction. And then on the CJC piece, and again, I'll turn it over to Emily after. Um, yeah, there is a piece on the RFP. Again, this was a detailed document that asked providers to actually break down for us, how will you resolve conflicts in the house? What processes will you use? What, how will you have the skills to uh, do uh, transform conflict. And many of those providers spoke explicitly to partnering with the community justice centers who are essentially localized subject matter experts on conflict, right? And harm from a, a relational process. And some actually have subcontracts. So some uh, of the awardees have written into their budgets, we are gonna spend X, you know, a couple thousand dollars to have ongoing circle facilitation training from our local justice center, or we've contracted for them to come in five times a year um, and, and actually conduct harm circles if there's a particular situation. So um, I'll leave it at that in case Emily wants uh, and has more to it, but uh, I'm glad you asked because uh, both of the community justice centers and the housing of course is all administered through the community and restorative justice unit. So we're looking to optimize for synergies there. Yeah, Emily? Emily doesn't have anything to say. You said it all, Derek. Okay, my apologies. <laughs> so we have a few more questions here. Uh, we have Mary and then Kirk. Yes, my question and thank you. Um, I was originally going to ask um, how this was different, you know, within the communities. And then you did bring up, uh, and, and first of all, let me be clear and transparent. I've been on a re my restorative justice um, program here in Bennington for a very long time, for close to 30 years. And I believe in the restorative justice. I believe in 
very good programming and transitional types of things that will help, help folks get out of uh, corrections and all facilities and actually do very well. And I, so I'm definitely for it. But as the conversation was going on, how is this different? And um, it probably brought to mind and uh, chairman, um, chair of Emmons knows the case, unfortunately. <laughs> How is this different or what have you improved since the time of, and you happen to bring up Commissioner Gorchek as well as John Perry, and I know them very well. Um, we had housing down here in Bennington, probably when that program started with the furlough program. And the safety nets were not there where the, where the apartments were put. What they would at times only get supervision, possibly if a parole officer was going by once, once a week, possibly two if you were lucky. At one point I had, I was in Montpelier in the legislature and getting from this one area calls from like all of the neighbors like what was going on the police department was not aware that in this one particular place there was over eight or ten people that were put in one building with no really person in the building that somewhat helped and supervised or was a mentor or whatever we're wanting to so how is it different from those times because it ended up also the way some of these programs are being placed. On the end, other end of this particular street, there was also a one of Vermont's worst, and I say it that way because that's how it was written in the newspapers at that time, was that one of the worst sex offenders in Vermont was housed or was allowed to be housed up the street which was by a small daycare center and everything else with no one being notified or that. We want to welcome people back into the community and support and do the right things we need to do. But how is your programs different from what it was back then? Because quite honestly, both of those got shut down. Unfortunately, well, you know, somewhat, I will say somewhat unfortunately, but there were not some of the safety nets or the kind of overview for folks to actually be helping the, you know, folks coming back and tr successfully transitioning back into the community. So how are your programs different? Can you answer that? Eric? Uh, I'm happy to, but I also don't want to... Um supersede any of my colleagues. So um, if Emily or the commissioner, uh, if he's still with us, wants to address that, by all means, if not, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, and I do have thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll take that Representative Marcy. Um, I think from where we are now, from what you've described, for, first of all, um, in general, dealing with individuals convicted of sexual crimes, it's difficult um, at best to place them um, because of um, the appearance or fear of, of a sex offender. And, I, and I, I think I'm gonna be correct when I say this and I'll, I'll stand to be correct if I'm wrong, but our experience, because we, we manage individuals based on risk. We don't, we don't manage them based on crimes. It's based upon their risk to reoffend. And um, whatever their conditions are to be supervised. Sex offenders probably have some of the lowest rates of recidivism, I believe, is accurate. So some of it's community. But I think the difference between what we're talking about now and what we talked about before is that in the theory of change in the request for proposals, we made it really clear, um, we made it really clear that we needed supports wrapped around them. And I'm not trying to belittle what went on before, but it was pretty much before, hey, here's an apartment, live in the apartment. Um, you know, with, with some services that you represented, maybe those safety nets were not there. I think the theory of change is really focused around 
how to better manage with a, with a COSA or um, a CJC or restorative justice. And we're really, uh, and we'll wrap, when we wrap this up, I wanna tie this back to our conversation this morning on the new facility. But I think the difference now is that we recognize, you heard me talk earlier today about um, we're, we're, we're test betting uh, a, a, a another theory of change, which is continuing chronic care model that's used in the medical field as we transition people out. And I think the difference is now that we recognize that we have to have that in place in order for people to be accepted, successful, and feel like they're part of the community. And something I've learned since I've been at Corrections is this, is that a lot of times um, the influence of the negativity um, put on the individual when they come to the community plays directly into their inability to be successful, if that makes sense. I hope that helps, Representative. Um, you know, somewhat, but I think sometimes, um, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe things have changed. And like I said, I want folks to come back. I want them to be welcomed back into the community to be successful in every way that they possibly can with not having that, you know, kind of over their head. However, I do think at times, and that's why, you know, Kerr and I have talked often about there needs to be strong um, programming in the community or um, initiatives that can help this. And sometimes I'm not always sure we hear about all of these community-based programs to help these folks. And quite often, sometimes it's seriously lacking. And so, you know, I would want to definitely know that those pieces are in place to successfully, you know, not hinder, really support and get folks back in. You know, just like one of the issues at one point or has been at times, and my understanding some of that is corrected very well, is that you would have people getting a job and then they'd get a job, but then they're, they're, um, they would have to meet with their um, person either at the, at our, like UCS, our United Counseling here in Bennington to do a program in the middle of their work day. Well, you, you and I probably both know that an employer is probably not going to be able to deal with that for too long. So we end up setting up some of our, the failures for these folks right out of the gate. So I want us to be honest and realistic, which I think you probably all are, but I want to make sure we've got the, you know, the network of programming that folks need in the community to make this honestly work. Because I think when we don't, that's when the problems have. And then everyone looks as though, oh, my God, we're against all these people trying to transition back in. And we're not. We want them to be a success. So can you possibly answer me that as to how you go about assessing in a community what the resources actually are to make the success stories that we need to have and want to have for these folks? Well, and Representative, I appreciate exactly what you're saying because I've talked about this a lot in front of this committee and other committees about the need for um, the need for um, services in communities that deal with folks that have complicated backgrounds. Now, with that said, I think a major difference here is that some of these services are baked into the contract with the housing folks. It's, it, the expectation is baked into the contracts. Um, and we have to depend on what- But you're saying the expectation, is it the reality or is it an expectation? And is it succeeding? That's really where I'm going. We can have expectations that don't always make it. So- I understand that, but we're starting something new and we don't know if it is gonna succeed, correct? I mean, that's that's my point I'm making. It's It's a- it's a movement away from what we've done in the past. And I can't predict um, how successful we'll be, but that's the reason why as part of the theory of change in part of the process is an evaluation of that. So we'll know. And what we're doing right now is following the science best we can. Back to your other point. Again, um, we, we do the best we can with what the services are. 
but part of what we asked for in these in these proposals was to um, was to to have services as part of the housing. That's part of what we asked for. Yes. And if I may, what I'm hearing goes beyond the housing piece, and I think is exactly what JRI is about. How through all of these things are we defraying costs associated with incarceration and reinvesting those resources into right. the community programs? And we are at the leading edge of the JRI value proposition right now. So I think exactly what you're speaking to is what we're all trying to achieve with starting by reducing re lodgings. And I would just and add one point um, to reinforce what the commissioner was saying is that every single agreement that we're funding uh, doesn't just fund housing, it funds staff to support, intensively support the folks in that housing and to ensure that they have service coordination for all the things that they need to help them succeed. So it's, it's an integral part of every single agreement that we're gonna have. I am certainly hoping for the best and that, you know, it is a, a successful model because that's what we do need. And um, with a little bit of that supervision, especially in the earlier days, to really make sure feet, folks get their feet on the ground and, and are able to manage through to become successful. And that's all I want, truly. So I'll look forward to, um, I guess, watching the process. But I hope folks will look very closely at what we're promising in communities um, with actual on the ground, boots on the ground, to be able to really support folks through this process. Rep. Morrissey, thank you for your volunteer service at your local community justice center. That's just the best to hear. So just want to acknowledge that. And I think Mary brings up a good point. And I, I was involved with this when there was a situation there down in Bennington. It was in the late 90s. Um, and it was unsupervised uh, up apartments in a block, just a building. Um, so I think what we have as a perception is that if there is a congregate housing situation, the perception to our communities is there is support services that are being offered there. And when folks are spread out into individual apartments, they're on their own and there is no support. And I think that's the perception that's out there. And um, I hope that the new model going forward for DOC is successful, that people can see, and I think we as legislators need to see this as well, that yes, folks can live in their own apartments or housing units, if their support services or with those support services in a wraparound service, instead of just plunking them in an apartment or a room and say, okay, it's up to you. And, you know, I think in the past, I go back to what Derek said, housing reentry was a relief valve from our overcrowded incarcerated facilities. That was the goal. Now we have a very, very different goal. We want the person to succeed and, and contribute back to the community. And we realize that our partners within the Agency of Human Services, within our different departments, within our different designated agencies back home, within our recovery centers, within our Department of Mental Health folks back home also need to be uh, invested in this as well, not just DOC. So let's hope that this model works and is different than what we've experienced in the past with people being uh, within their own apartments because that did not work. So we have another question here, Kurt. Yeah, this um, looks really good. I like it, I'm impressed. Uh, and it's 
certainly well organized. Um, of particular interest to me is the, uh, the training that, that will be done on your second page of your new actions and training and support. Well, they're actually, because I assume they'll, these um, people will be still supervised by probation and parole. And is there going to be formal training for the probation and parole officers that will be doing that? Uh, <clears throat> so, Good. okay. Uh, yeah, yes, there is. The short answer is yes, there is. We're working closely with the council state governments. And the, since some of the change in legislation has been going on, the education process is ongoing and we're going to be doing more training um, that's nationally recognized um, with our partners from the council state governments. Yep, good, good. Uh, and on the, and of course I love the flow chart at the bottom because I'm, that's from my programming history. So, and you're now at the, you finished with the DOC determines the awardees or that's where you are. And the next, the next stage is particularly interesting to me because, and, and the way that you described it, because being able to evaluate those people that you select for the contract and learning are both really important how that works. But, but at this point, um, we, we need a baseline in order to tell how well this is playing out over the years. And so we can look at this data and say, yes, the expected values did come about. Do you have some baseline data? Such, uh, for, a, for instance, I'm not sure how many people we actually a year have in transitional housing and how many of those end up um, maybe not recidivating because the courts are so clogged at this point, but how many of them would be, would be recidivating if the courts were processing? Is that, are those numbers available? And, and if so, is there a way that we could get those? You know, Kurt, it might be more refined. It may not be recidivism. It may be technical violations. Yeah, yeah, well, both that, of those or all of them. When, when you say recidivism, you think people are creating a new crime. The issue that, that the Justice Center found out more was people were being violated for technical violations. Ah, okay, yeah, that's yeah. true. I think, of not, I think of recidivism as being reincarcerated. Right. Yeah, so it's probably recidivism is based on a new crime. Right. Yeah, you're right. So, so anyway, that as well, recidivism and or <laughs> and um, smaller uh, the technical violations. What would be a revocation, a violation okay. of, of probation? Do, anyway, do we have that information, and is it can be uh, somehow made available? Well, the, the technical violation piece is, is in the materials that were generated by. Um, CSG, and it's, it's in the reinvestment information. So that's easy enough to get. Recidivism is a little bit harder for us because you can have somebody that's no longer supervised by us that commits a new crime that could be considered, um, you know, uh, reoccurring another crime and going back. So I, I, I'd have to check with staff to find out how complicated that is. But, but I, would, I would refer you to all the work that's been done with, with uh, CSG and the reinvestment because the technical violation information is pretty well documented there. Yeah, that, that's true. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit old. I think it was 2019, but, right. but uh, it would be interesting to know because you have decreased the, you know, specifically with the women, the number of women who are now incarcerated, it would be interesting to know how many of those that we released over the last year or so What's happened to them? How well are they doing in the community? Um, because we obviously thought that they were able to go there. And what problems are they having that this new approach might be able to solve? But all this sounds very good. I'm impressed. And, and, and anything that we can do to move this along, be certain to let us know. I, I do have one thing, actually, uh, <laughs> if I may. Oh, um, yeah, and uh, Looping back again to uh, Representative Dolan's question, because I, I think it's important to recognize that we are, we with this theory of change, it does shift the, the balance of our trust to say that housing is a public health issue and corrections housing is all the more a public health issue. And complex public problems rely on the participation of the public. They cannot be solved purely by government. 
and, and, and frankly, where the rubber hits the road is uh, housing stock. And, you know, just to name the obvious, we are a state with a tight housing market. And so I think one of the ways that all of us can actually contribute to the solution is if anyone, I mean, you know, this is crowdsourcing. This is, if, if you are aware of safe housing that you or a colleague or a family member has and they, and, uh, and they can rent it and they can choose if they're gonna Airbnb it or rent it to a Vermonter who is trying to rebuild a life I mean, I think we are at a moment where we have to look inward at our resources and housing as a foundational one and try to uh, pull it together. The providers that we've found, we have tremendous confidence in. They have stock, but they also need to develop relationships and they have the capacity and the professional experience and the tenancy law and all of those professionalized skills. But at the end of the day, I think we are at a moment in Vermont where we're asking ourselves, how serious are we about working with our most uh, complex and, and vulnerable, even though these are corrections involved people, they are still vulnerable to homelessness. And so um, I just really wanna put in a public plug in so far as this is a public uh, uh, town square, if you will, that we, uh, if we all looked around our own networks, I bet you we could be uh, exponentialize the solutions that corrections is poised to monetize. Thank you, Derek. We do have another question here, Michelle. Uh, sorry, I actually have a, a comment uh, just in response to what uh, uh, Representative Taylor said, if that's okay. He asked about uh, the recidivism rate. And I was just going to say, if, if you think back to that chart that was shared today, the theory of change, one of the things that they indicate on there is that the more meaningful relationships the person can have, the more integrated they are into the community, the less li likely or the more likely they are to be successful. And um, as a person who worked in restorative justice at a community justice center until last November, I can give you a small, unscientific, but accurate number that 100% of the people that I worked with did not, did not get returned to prison who were working intensively in the COSA system. There was exactly one person I worked with who was returned to prison. It was a technical violation before justice reinvestment that was related to losing housing. So my experience from my own work with people uh, who are reentering society and from talking to people all over the state is that those more intensive supports like COSAs, like um, matching people up so that they can do follow-ups after the COSAs, you know, all those kind of supports, they really, really work. I mean, we used to hear the number 26% of COSA uh, people in COSAs, sorry, people who had COSAs had 26% lower rate of recidivism. But in my personal experience, it was, that would be, it was 100%. I mean, like I worked with people who had been out of prison for between one day and five years. And like I said, none of them had recommitted new crimes or been sent back from new crimes. There had been some relapses, but um, that was it. And so I guess I would just like to say to this group that there are ways that we as a committee, we as a state, we as a department of corrections, if we put our investments right into building the proper kinds of connections for our individuals when they leave prison, hopefully that will be helping them to not go back. And so I'm really grateful that we're working on these issues and I'm grateful the approach that Department of Corrections is taking right now because I think this is gonna help move our society in a better way. It's better for the people coming out of prison and it's gonna be better for our system. If people are, are not reoffending, hopefully hopefully they're, they're engaging in their community in, in a good way. So sorry, that was a little long-winded but this is an issue I care about a lot. So that's a good way to wrap up our morning and I think to get to that point of success, there's some hurdles where folks did not have their RFPs renewed, uh, their grants renewed, and that's that's a heavy lift to get through. Um, and um, that's what we'll be working through for the next few weeks for people to adjust to that and um, accept a new model. And that's going to be difficult for uh, those providers, but it will also be difficult for some of our colleagues to uh, help our colleagues understand the shift. It's, there'll be some pressures applied for sure. For that. Madam Chair, I, I know folks are trying to get, we're over. I, I just, no, fine. I, I just, I want to just respond to, to, to the last comments from the representative, right? <clears throat> I'm hoping people are starting to see that there is 
there is a method to our madness inside corrections that people are starting to see how we are the, the housing piece is one piece the work that that's coming out of justice reinvestment is another piece the work that we're doing at the facility in, in Chittenden, at the end of the day um representative Boslin, you you couldn't have framed up what i wanted to close with better we have the services i believe we have the services in most areas of the state except for the complicated population but if we leverage wraparound services taking this model of, of continuing chronic care with where we're going with housing our success rate of keeping people out of facilities i think will go up significantly and and some of the work that we're doing inside Chittenden is like <clears throat> it's it's a it's a um, it's like an incubator test bed of what we're doing to take the other operations around the state. So I hope you can see where the housing's tied into when I talk about the programming this morning about about the facilities and why we have to really focus on what is the programming will make our facility look like. And I'm hoping the pieces are starting to come together. And with that. I'll stop talking so people can get the lunch. That's a great way to finish. Thank you. Thank you all this morning. Um, it's been a very informative morning and it's a good way of connecting the pieces because as the commissioner just said, we're all integrated. We may think of them in isolation, but they're not. It's a continuum. So thank you all. I know that we had Carrie Brown for the uh, Women's Commission scheduled this morning. We've been working, trying to see if she would be available this afternoon. Um, and I'm not sure if that uh, carried through. I knew she was free. Um, so we will see if we'll be back this afternoon with that testimony.